Well, we have to be long-suffering with Brother Rudy. You know, when I get to be 85, I hope that I can function as well as he is, does. 902 is going to be the invitation song. Um, if you want to mark that, if you didn't get a chance earlier to do that, 902. And we'll uh, sing that out of the song book. And then if you turn your, to your uh, sermon supplement again, you'll see the outline for our lesson tonight. Is there absolute truth? It's a question, and it's one that is worthy of our time uh, to answer. Now, I'll uh, go ahead and, and tip my hat to you uh, this evening, or tip my hand to you this morning. And uh, Rudy? <laughs> it's evening, right? Um. I think the Bible helps us answer this question. And the burden of proving that is upon me tonight. I understand that. And I believe that we can effectively do that through the pages of Scripture. So um, I think it is a question that is worthy of our time uh, to consider and to answer. Let me encourage you to turn to John chapter 18. I want us to uh, notice a conversation that is taking place here between uh, Jesus and Pilate. Jesus has been uh, arrested. Gethsemane is behind him. The cross is uh, before him. And he's in that um, uh, intermediate uh, period there between the garden and the cross. And uh, he's going through the, the, um, the uh, uh, false trial. Uh, he's innocent. Uh, he's going to endure the beating and the scorning that's going to be placed upon him. And in the midst of this, he has a conversation with Pilate. And this takes place beginning in, in verse 37. And we're cutting into the middle of their conversation. It's longer than just these two verses. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus in the previous verses has spoken about being a king. A ruler. And are you a king? You say, uh, excuse me, um, are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Verse 38, Pilate said to him, What is truth? The verse goes on just a little bit, but I want to highlight his response to Jesus. Jesus begins to talk about truth, and Pilate comes back and says, Well, what is truth? How can we define truth? How can we understand truth? How can I know that what you're saying is truth? How can any of us come to a reasonable understanding of what is truthful? Now, it's an honest question, and I'll go so far as to say this. It's a fair question. Of course, Pilate isn't one who wants to see. He's going to find him innocent, but he's still going to be turned over to the people. But Pilate isn't one who's reaching the point where he is saying, well, yeah, I guess you're right. There is truth. He's not there, but he raises a, a fair question. What is this thing called truth? I want you to put your, your thinking cap on. If you notice the little picture there on the screen behind me, I, I want us to kind of look a little bit deeper into this concept of um, is there absolute truth? Can we really know that truth is something that is, first of all, knowable, and secondly, attainable? That I can know what truth is, and then I can do it. I can hold to it. I can live it out in my life. Are those two things uh, possible? There is a school of thought, and I give this to you there on your outline, called postmodernism. Now, postmodernism uh, is something that we all need to be mindful of because since 1970 and all the way up to today, postmodernism has worked its way not just into the philosophy of our universities, but postmodernism has even worked its way into congregations. It's worked its way into the church. And postmodernism is this philosophy, this belief system that says there is no such thing as absolute truth. So someone who holds to a postmodern belief would kind of be like Pilate and they would challenge you and say, well, what is truth? I hear you talking about truth. I hear you calling me to be a person that holds the truth. But their response would be, well, what is that? 
Meaning, how, how can we possibly know what truth is? One who holds to a postmodern theology is one who's going to challenge any type of uh, system in which um, the idea of absolute truth is presented to them. They're, they're going to um, fight against it. They're going to hold against it. Now, the odd thing is, is that postmodernism is what we call self, a self-contradiction. In a debate uh, type of terminology, it's called a self-defeating argument. Why? Because if somebody truly believes in postmodernism, and if somebody truly believes that there are no absolute truths, well, then they have contradicted themselves because the idea that there are no absolute truths is what? A truth. It's a truth. If I say there's no absolute truth, I'm presenting that to you as being a fact as being something that is real. So postmodernism is not only a contradiction in and of itself, it defeats itself. When we talk about absolute truth, we're talking about that which is the real state of things. Absolute truth are those things that are facts, recognized as facts, proven as being facts. When we talk about this idea of absolute truth, it is, it is, it is those things that are um, best defined as being an inflexible reality. It's not going to bend, not going to give away. Absolute truth has been defined as some people as being a permanent fact. Doesn't matter how much time goes by, it's never going to change. It doesn't matter how long that fact has been in existence. It's always been a permanent fact. It's always been seen as true. So postmodernism is going to find itself in a very difficult position when it comes to this idea that there are no absolute truths because in and of themselves they're arguing for the fact that not having truths is a truth. I want to highlight just a couple of things, and I'll, I'll put them up on the outline behind me, the main headings, but more detail is on your outline there. I want us to understand that when it comes to kind of a postmodern view, it places itself in contradiction with the world, that there are no absolute facts. Well, even society, we haven't gotten to religion yet. We haven't gotten to those things that we as a people believe, but even the world around us teaches us that there are um, uh, inflexible realities. There are permanent facts. Consider, for example, math. I'm not the best at math, but anybody will agree with me from a great math scholar down to a little child learning their, their additions and subtractions that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's a fact, church. It's an inflexible trap. Uh, fact. Now, I may add 2 plus 2 and get 5, but I'm wrong. I may say that 2 plus 2 is 3, but I'm wrong. It is a fact in the world that when you take two things and two things and you put them together, you have 4. Uh, that the fact that the world has absolute truth is seen in the idea of science. I wonder why when I dropped that it didn't float up. Let me try it again. That's odd. Law of gravity is a fact. It's an absolute truth. If I jump off of this stage, I'm not going to float. Gravity is going to pull me down to the ground. So again, postmodernism has set itself up against a, a whole host of things that are in complete opposition to it. Math has facts. Science, the law of gravity has facts. Even history has facts. Neil Armstrong, it is a fact, was the first man to walk on the surface of the moon. Doesn't matter which history book you turn to, doesn't matter uh, wh what person you ask, it is a fact, it is a permanent fact, an inflexible reality. That first footprint is from Neil Armstrong. When we talk about history and its facts, we can uh, come to, or, um, excuse me, geography is another area in which we have facts. If I tell you that the United States of America is located in North America, it doesn't matter whether or not you believe it, it's a fact. If I tell you that, if I ask you to point out on a map where, where the United States of America is and you put it over in, in Asia, you're just wrong because the fact is America is located in North America. It's a fact. If I were to ask you what the tallest mountain on the face of the planet is, if you were to say Mount McKinley, you'd be wrong. It's not. It doesn't matter that you may believe it, you're wrong. 
If I were to say, what's the tallest mountain on the earth? You say, well, Kilimanjaro. You're wrong. It is a fact, inflexible reality, permanent. It is a fact that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on the face of the planet. So when we begin to process this idea, as, is there such a thing as an absolute truth? Well, already we would have to concede, well, all around me in the world there's absolute truth. There are things that are clear facts that cannot be denied. And whether or not I agree with it doesn't change the fact of whether or not it is true, right? Doesn't change the fact that it's true. Well, we take that type of concept of, of the postmodernist who says, oh, there's no absolute truth, and we say, well, you know what? Even the world proves that type of philosophy wrong, that there are absolute truths. And then we bring in the area of the Bible. We, we bring in the area of, of religion. The Bible even affirms the fact that there are absolute truths, and the Bible gives us the understanding that these absolute truths are knowable, that we can understand them that we can reason from them, that we can follow them, that we can teach them to other people. I can teach you in a geography class that Mount Everest is the tallest mountain. You can learn it and know it. I can teach you in, in a math class that one plus one is two, and two plus two is four. I can teach you those facts. Well, the Bible says that there are facts in a spiritual realm that you can be taught, that are knowable, that are true, and you can live by. I want to highlight just a, a few of these uh, this evening. In Proverbs 23 and verse 23, if there's no such thing as absolute truth, the psalmist got it wrong. Because it's the psalmist who says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Well, listen, if there's no such thing as truth, absolute truth, inflexible reality, a permanent fact, then what is the psalmist talking about? I don't want to buy something that's wrong. Why should I invest myself in something that's not going to be matter, that's going to be, you know, uh, irrelevant to me? The psalmist is talking about absolute truth. And his encouragement is buy it, get it, live by it, have it, obtain it in your life, be a person of truth, and whatever you do, don't get rid of it. Don't sell it. I don't think you'd have to convince the psalmist that there's a thing called absolute truth. We see in other places like John chapter 17 and verse 17 where Jesus says, Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Well, if that's not an absolute fact, then why would Jesus call us to hold to the word of God? Now, you, you can turn to the pages of the New Testament. You can find Jesus being as honest as he possibly can be. When he encounters people, he doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't try and sugarcoat it. He doesn't try to present it better than it really is. He presents things as being absolutely the way they are, truthfully. He does it compassionately, but he's honest. So when it comes to there being a thing of truth, Jesus says, sanctify them in thy word. Thy word is truth. He affirms that there is a thing called absolute truth. He doesn't say, sanctify them in thy truth, which is relative. I mean, sanctify them in your truth, which is going to change from time to time and really not mean what it means now. It's, not, it's, it's, it, it's flexible. It's not inflexible. It, it could change at any moment. He doesn't make that argument. He's honest. Sanctify them in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus is talking about that which is absolute. We see the same thing in John 8 and verse 32. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Well, if that truth is not absolute, then how could we ever have the guarantee of the second part of that verse? Being set free. If it's not absolute, then it can't set me free. Why? Because it may have been at a time, and it set me free, but now that truth has changed, and it can't set you free. It's not absolute. It's changed. It's fluid. It's always moving. We really don't know what that truth is, right? You shall know the truth, and if you're lucky, maybe it'll set you free. Well, that's not what Jesus says. He's talking about an absolute. You shall know the truth, absolute, permanent, and the end result, well, he can make you free. Free from sin. Free from separation from God. Free from the fear of knowing that if you were to die, you would be separated from God and Christ for eternity. Free to live spiritually as a forgiven person. You shall know the truth absolute, and it shall set you free. 
So we can begin to see that truth is something that we should desire to possess it. Don't get rid of it. Uh, truth is something that is unchanging. It's there for us to guide us. Truth is something that provides us a way to know that we can be a free spiritual people. And then truth is something that can help us to do that which is right as compared to that which is wrong in the world. Consider the words that uh, Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 beginning in verse 16. He's dealing with absolute truth. Well, notice how he tells us this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now I'll give you verse 17 in a second, but think about what he says in verse 16. If there's no such thing as absolute truth, then really we couldn't preach that verse today. Because the very scripture that was profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in, the, in righteousness in the first century may not be the same truth that is useful for doctrine and correction and instruction in righteousness today. Why, if the truth is fluid, if it's flexible, if we really can't know it, if it's not possible to hold to it, if there are no real facts, well then we need to cut verse 16 out of our New Testament. But Paul is presenting that which is dealing in absolutes. That the very things that he is saying to Timothy are things that we can say to one another. For all scripture, we already know that the word of God is truth, John 17, 17. We already know that the word of God can set us free, John 8 and verse 32. So when Paul comes along and says all scripture, he's dealing with truth. All scripture is God breathed truth. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What's the end result of this truth? Verse 17. That the man of God may be complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. I'll suggest to you that a wonderful definition of the end result of absolute truth is verse 17. It makes us whole. When we hold to absolute truth, when we believe in absolute truth, when we accept absolute truth. I understand that not everybody accepts the truth of God's word. I get it. But it doesn't change the fact that it is true. The end result of me being a person who accepts absolute truth is that I become complete, whole, thoroughly equipped. I have all that I need for every good work. That's what absolute truth helps us to do. Again, we come back to the postmodern mindset that is, it's in the universities, it's in our schools, it's working its way through the church. You're going to encounter people who are going to say, well, listen, um, the, the situation will determine whether or not something's true. It's called relativism, moral relativism. Well, there's no such thing as an absolute truth, so therefore moral relativism is right. You see, you say that I, that I ought not to steal or lie or cheat, but you know what? The situation determines whether or not I should do that. Not the fact that God's word says don't do this. Moral relativism, the situation that I find myself in because I'm a postmodernist, and I don't believe there's absolute truth. So I'll base my decision on whether or not I should steal or cheat or lie or murder based on what's taking place in the situation at hand. Does that sound anything like 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17? Does that sound remotely close to anything that the, proverb, the writer of Proverbs 23, 23 is saying when he says, buy the truth and don't sell it? Doesn't sound that way to me. Does it sound anything like Jesus is saying as a people who are set free by the truth in John 8 and verse 32? Doesn't sound like it to me. What about John 17, 17? It kind of just obliviates that verse, doesn't it? Sanctify them in that truth. Thy word is truth. No, uh Relativism is true. Not what your word says, God. What the situation around me dictates. That's where I'll determine truth. One cannot be honestly. One cannot be a proponent of postmodernism and yet defend the word of God. How's that possible? We've already seen that God's word deals in truth, absolute truth. So it's simply not possible for us. Remember I told you to put your thinking cap on. It's simply not logical to have that type of mindset that says, well, we really can't know what truth is. That it can't be absolute. Remember what I said earlier? It's a self-defeating argument. Well, if you argue there's no truth, that becomes a truth. I, I want to leave you th this evening 
with some things in Scripture that are presented to us as being absolutes. They don't change. Um, these things that when attached to the idea, the concept, the reality of truth are unchanging, are inflexible, are permanent. As one definition of absolute truth says, it's the real state of things. It's how things really are. And I'll suggest to you just a few things here. Just a few things to show us that the Bible deals in what we could call absolutes. Here's the first thing, that God created everything. Genesis 1 and verse 1. It's an absolute. It's presented, in fact, if you turn over to the book of Genesis and chapter 1 and verse 1, it's presented to us as a fact. There's no argument to prove that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. There's no long dissertation following verse 1 saying, well, let me argue this fact to try and convince you. It's presented as a fact. In the beginning, God. Period. He's the one who's bringing everything into existence. He's the one who created everything. It's presented as an absolute. Again, I understand not everybody accepts it as an absolute, but I also understand that not everybody believes that Neil Armstrong is the first man to walk on the moon. I also understand that there are people out there, as crazy as this may sound, who don't believe that 2 plus 2 is 4. Just because one refuses to accept an absolute truth doesn't mean that it ceases to be an absolute truth. The Bible presents the truth that God created everything. The Bible presents the understanding as a truth that all have sinned. We looked at it this morning, Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The word there all is pos. Absolutely everyone. Nobody escapes. For all, everyone has sinned. Again, I don't want to weary you. I understand not everybody agrees with that. It doesn't change the fact that it's a truth, that it's an absolute truth. We can see an absolute in the understanding that Jesus is the way to God. Probably one of the verses that is under the most challenge today in our society is John 14 and verse 6. A very simple verse in which Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not what gets the verse challenged. It's the second part. I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. It's that second part that people are challenging. Now, wait a minute. Why, you can't leave off this group of people that have 13 million followers who don't even believe in Jesus as not being right with God? Well, now, wait a minute. If you hold to this John 14 and verse 6, well, you're counting out uh, uh, one billion people over here that believe in God and they believe in a plan of salvation that doesn't have anything to do with Jesus. Why? You've got a problem with John 14 and verse 6. Listen, it doesn't matter that they don't accept it as absolute truth. It still is that Jesus is is the only way to God. He said so himself. Now listen, the same one who's speaking in John 14 and verse 6 is the same one who spoke in John 17, 17. The same one who spoke in John 8 and verse 32. That there is absolute truth, that we can know it, that the truth does set us free. Again, Jesus is the way to God. It's inflexible. It's permanent. It's the real state of things. It's an absolute. We come from the pages of Scripture and we learn that baptism is essential to salvation. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Now again, the great challenge is, well, I don't like that. I don't like this uh, uh, this concept of, of baptism being essential, so therefore I reject it. That's your choice. I won't, I won't argue that you don't have the right to reject it. You do. I would argue that you're in error. Because baptism is presented as being that which is not only essential, Mark 16, 16, Acts 22 and verse 16, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Acts 2 and verse 38, Ephesians 1 and verse 7. That baptism is not only presented as that which is essential, but it's presented as an absolute truth. It's inflexible. It's unchanging. Another concept that we see, these are just a few suggestions being thrown out there, is that one of the absolutes in Scripture is the understanding that there's one church, Ephesians 4 and verse 5. Well, goodness, church, all you have to do is pick up your local phone book, 
flip to the section called churches, and you will see that there's a multitude of churches out there, not just in our community. The next time you go to another city, look in their phone book. Next time you go to a big metropolitan area, open up their phone book, and you'll find I was in one hotel room one time. I opened up their phone book under the area of churches, and I found 17 pages of churches. 17 pages, one list after another, right? Yet the Bible gives us the understanding in Ephesians 4 and verse 5, there's one body. That Jesus Christ is the head of only one body. Colossians chapter 1. That Jesus Christ died, shed his blood for one body, one church. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Yet I understand that the world doesn't always accept that as being an absolute truth. Again, it doesn't matter if they accept it as a truth. It doesn't change the fact that it is a truth. There's one church, there's one body, and there's one savior of that body. Why, you can't believe in the concept of one church if you don't believe in the concept that Jesus is the one way to God, because Jesus only purchased one church. All of these things, we have our thinking cap on still. All of these things give us the understanding that when presented with this idea of postmodernism, it simply can't be true. It simply can't be right because not only in the area of religion and faith as they would define it, not only in the area of religion and faith are there absolutes that are presented to us. It is this way and this way only. God, all of sin, Jesus the only way, baptism essential, one salvation, a, a, a one church. Not just in the area of religion, but even in the area of the world. There are presented to them absolute facts, truths that are non-negotiable, that don't change regardless of how we want to. Listen, don't test the law of gravity. Don't do it. You'll lose. Why? It is a fact. It is an absolute truth. If you jump off of your house, you're going to come crashing down to the ground. You won't float with like Wile E. Coyote and the little road runner. You won't float. Gravity will pull you down to the earth with a great thud. You see, we're, we're, we're able to understand because of what the Bible teaches. And remember, that was my responsibility tonight when I began to answer that question. Is there absolute truth? The burden was upon me. I believe we've proved it with Scripture. That there is a thing called truth. And you can know it. John 17, 17. You can be set free by it. John 8 and verse 32. That you can use it to shape and guide and lead your life, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. And that when you find the truth, don't give it up, Proverbs 23, 23. Is there absolute truth? Absolutely. I put this little sentence there at the bottom of your outline. Absolute truth exists. Then I make this comment. A Christian, excuse me, as Christians... We should affirm and defend this fact. Postmodernism isn't going away. Listen, relativism, moral relativism isn't going to disappear in our lifetime. And so as Christians, we're going to be called upon from time to time, more times than we may even want to realize, we're going to be called upon to be a people who affirm absolute truth. It's not always fun, not always comfortable, not always received very well. But listen, it's our responsibility as Christians to affirm those things that the Bible presents as being inflexible, permanent, knowable truth. The question then is, will we? Will we? Well, I hope we all will. We're going to be led in our song of uh, invitation this evening. If we can uh, encourage you in any way, we, we want to do that. It is an absolute truth that prayer works. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. It is an absolute truth that God forgives sins. 1 John 1 and verse 9. Begin really in verse 7 and work your way to verse 9. It is an absolute truth that the church in prayer is a powerful, powerful body of believers. And maybe you need the church praying for you tonight. Well, we want to do that. 
if you're here this evening and you're not a member of the New Testament church, if you're not a Christian, friend, it is an absolute truth that you need to be. Through obedience to the gospel plan of salvation, to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized, you come into a saved relationship with God through Christ. That relationship that teaches you in truth that all spiritual blessings are yours, Ephesians 1 and verse 3. That heaven is indeed a reality for you for eternity. As Jesus says in Revelation 2 and verse 10, be faithful unto death. We're in it for the crown of life. We're in it for eternity. If you're here tonight and you're ready to be